Hello, I'm Christian Sandvig, and today we're going to be talking about uh, Internet fundamentals. Uh, in the next few minutes, what I'd like to cover with you are three basic problems that will help you understand legal issues related to the Internet. The first problem I'll discuss will be sovereignty and jurisdiction, the second, technological capability, and the third, technology and law and policy. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to work through a specific example of how information is exchanged on the Internet, and then I will explain how these basic problems recur. When I say basic problems, I mean that whenever you're dealing with any particular law and policy issue related to the Internet, you're likely going to encounter these. What I'm going to do for my example is something called a trace route. A trace route uh, you could think of as a way for us to examine how information is exchanged on the Internet. Um, it's something that you can do on your own, and I'll explain that a little later. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine that I'm accessing a website on the Internet so that I can show you how it works behind the scenes. I'm going to access a website called panet.ps. This is a website suggested by a student. It's a Palestinian news site. Here's a screenshot from panet.ps. Since I've made these slides, the URL has changed, but that doesn't matter. Just imagine that we're accessing a news site on the Internet. This screen is uh, an example of traceroute software. Uh, I'll explain what's happening on the screen as we go through it. But basically, what you need to know is I've picked a particular brand of traceroute software that shows its results visually, so you can watch as the packets flow through the Internet. So imagine that I'm using a computer and I want to visit the website at panet.ps, the Palestinian news site. I'm starting the software now. Um, so you see what the software has done is uh, I've been located in the United States and I've requested a website from panet.ps. It's a little confusing right away, but don't worry. Um, what you're seeing is that uh, along the top it shows that the request for the website went through a number of different servers on the Internet. Um, you might think that the domain name .ps has something to do with Palestine, because .ps stands for Palestine, and you would be correct. If we zoom in on the map feature of the software, uh, we can see that the packets took a route from the United States, where I was when I made the request, to London, and then they went to Israel. Looked at in a, a tabular form, you can see that uh, I began by going through an internet site in Ashburn, Virginia, then I went to London, and then I went to Haifa. Now, you could imagine the trace route as a kind of tap that lets you see where packets go. It's not always accurate, and in fact, in this trace route, you see there are some Israel question marks at the bottom, because we're not sure exactly where those packets go. The reason I'm showing you this software uh, to help you understand Internet fundamentals is that when you use the Internet, it can often seem as though the Internet is a kind of undifferentiated and confusing thing where you magically put in an address and hit enter and then it returns a web page. The thing I'm trying to emphasize is that whenever you do that, the information actually goes through specific servers and when you have a legal question or a policy question related to Internet communications, these are going to be very important. So you can see that as far as I can tell, this website is not hosted in Palestine, it's hosted in Israel. Um, but I'm not entirely sure because the trace route didn't work. Before I discuss the implications, I'm going to try another trace route of a different website. This website, visitpalestine.ps, was also uh, suggested by a student. And it's a tourism website encouraging people to visit Palestine. So here's a screenshot of visitpalestine.ps. So again, imagine that I want to see this website, so I put that visitpalestine.ps into my browser, and I hit enter. Again, we see the same traceroute software. We put in visitpalestine.ps, it begins, uh, and a few things have happened. One thing that's happened is that you can see on the map on the bottom that the route that the packets took is a little bit surprising. It's maybe not what you expected, and it's not the same as the route taken um, by the last website that we tried. If I zoom in on the map, it looks like what's happening is that my traffic started out again somewhere in Virginia, and then it looks like it went to Los Angeles, 
and then it went to London, but it didn't get anywhere near the Middle East or Palestine. Um, so the reason I'm showing you this trace route is I'm trying to draw your attention to the fact that the internet does actually consist of real computers where your traffic is stored and transmitted. It consists of actual wires where the traffic flows. And it's important to understand these for legal reasons in addition to technical reasons. One thing that you might notice out of this example is that um, you have a website that claims to be in Palestine, and in both cases it doesn't seem to be in Palestine. In the first case it seems to be in Haifa, and in this case, visitpalestine.ps, it appears to be located probably in Los Angeles. Why uh, is this important? Well, uh, as a lawyer you'll be interested in this topic because of our first basic problem. I promise to address three basic problems today. The first problem I promise to address is sovereignty and jurisdiction. Um, so you might see on these charts that internet traffic flows through all kinds of countries and there have been persistent debates in every instance where the internet is called into some adjudication setting as to which laws and policies should apply. In fact, it's often been the case where if you're concerned about taking some sort of legal or policy action, the issue of sovereignty and jurisdiction is paramount. This has been called by Lawrence Lessig the problem of competing sovereigns on the internet. So for example, instead of using a web page, what if we were doing a trace route that showed the path that an email took across the internet? Some people have argued that um, they should be able to apply the law of a country where the email has transited. And yet, not only is it difficult to determine where the email went exactly, um, but it might be not where you expected. In this case, we see that um, visit PANet, excuse me, visit Palestine.ps was actually located in Los Angeles. That's probably because Los Angeles had fast internet connectivity. Manuel Castell said that networks are things that connect valuable places in a non-contiguous pattern, and that's true of the internet. We find more location of internet servers it, where there is a lot of value, and so you might be surprised to find things like. Polish websites located in Chicago or London or where there is a lot of capacity. This creates all kinds of opportunity for discussion of sovereignty and jurisdiction, but my emphasis to you is that just because this seems mysterious doesn't mean that there is no way to tell where these I internet packets go or where they are. They are somewhere and they're on an actual machine. Going back to the visual trace route software, you see that in this trace route, we saw that visitpalestine.ps seems to be located in Los Angeles. That's probably because internet connectivity is cheap in Los Angeles, and it's likely that if you locate content there, it will be accessible by the most people in the fastest amount of time. This is a picture of a Facebook server room just because the internet seems immaterial doesn't mean that it is. There are actually these locations that can be traced that house things like email and web servers. Uh, and it's going to often be important to determine where exactly these communications are if you're interested in considering a problem related to internet policy. Here's a map showing Google data centers as of 2008. Uh, these data center locations are often secret, but you'll notice that they're clustered in only a few places in the world. Um, this is significant because let's imagine that you were interested in the case of an email uh, that was intercepted, perhaps you would argue illegally. Well, you would want to know exactly where this email was and what the corporate entity was that had something to do with it if it was a corporation. So just because we have a large corporation uh, and email seems mysterious doesn't mean that it is. I would bet, given this map in 2008, that if, for example, someone had sent an email with Gmail in Brazil, it's probably going to be stored in data center number 33, uh, which you see there on the map. These data centers are significant. I'm, I'm showing you a picture of some of them, in part because they're often located because of the law. So it might be that it's useful to have your traffic in a jurisdiction that has one interpretation of the law versus another. A good example of this is uh, internet gambling, um, which often generates gigantic data centers uh, where, for example, online poker games are hosted such that they can be outside of the jurisdictions uh, where online gambling is illegal. 
This example helps us talk about the first problem I promised to talk about, that's sovereignty and jurisdiction, but it also can help us think about the other problems. Um, the second problem that's a recurring problem when thinking about the internet is that of technological capability. Um, so when interacting with the law, uh, it might be that the, the ability of the technology to do something is an important issue. Um, so for instance, uh, if you're interested in, say, the way that traffic flows on the internet, a question of technology that might arise is, is it possible for an internet service provider to know who had access to a particular communication? Um, or is it possible for an internet service provider to tap or to investigate the contents of an email box? I mention this because in past disputes about the internet, um, there's often been a big disconnect between technological capability uh, and the needs or desires of law and policy. A famous case in France hinged on the question of whether or not it was possible for large internet companies to know that a user was operating in France if they were not operating in France. Um, the question then was, should French law apply um, not just because the users were located in France, that would be our first question, but the second question would be, is it possible for, say, Yahoo or Google or a large internet company to tailor their operation of their service so that a different thing would happen in France because the law would be different there. Um, the internet companies in, in that instance argued that it was impossible. The courts didn't believe them and then it turned out that it was possible. So it turns out that you often find internet companies arguing that the needs of the law are impossible. But my lesson to you is that in fact there could be a wide range of things that are possible in the technology that the companies simply don't want to do for cost. Um, for example, it might be possible for an internet company to record who uses a particular website over a long period of time, but this would generate substantial costs because there would need to be a computer somewhere with a hard disk that would be filling with records of who looks at that website. And this would be a, a cost the internet carrier might not want to incur. And so this discussion of what is technologically possible often recurs in issues related to the internet. It's a separate problem of that of sovereignty and jurisdiction, although obviously they're related. The third issue I want to talk about is that of technology in law and policy, and this is also something that recurs over and over again when you have the internet or any technological topic at issue in law and policy. Um, what I mean by that is that when we want to write a law or policy that deals with the internet, it's often difficult for us to find the right words to use. Uh, let me show you an example. This is the Wiretap Act in the United States, although really it could be any act in any country dealing with technology. So you see, it says, any person who intentionally intercepts, endeavors to intercept, or procures any other person to intercept, or endeavor to intercept, any wire, oral, or electronic communication shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than five years. This law used to refer to oral communication only. In fact, it used to refer to telephones because they wanted to pass a law that was made it clear that you weren't supposed to listen to other people's phone calls. But then, as the years went by, it became unclear as to whether emails should be treated as phone calls or not. And they added this hedging language any wire, oral, or electronic communication. Originally, the word wiretap referred to wired phone calls, and there was some dispute as to whether phone calls carried over radio signals should be covered or not, because that would obviously be wireless and not wired. This law has been revised in the 1980s to try and make it more expansive, but as a result, it's very expansive. So you see, any wire, oral, or electronic communication, this is incredibly broad. We could imagine many instances in which it might seem like we're violating the Wiretap Act because it's really a quite a broadly written law. Other laws can refer to specific pieces of technology that are obsolete. So for example, in many privacy laws around the world, they'll refer to things in the, in the statute like a pen register. A pen register is an obsolete piece of technology that was once used in the telephone network to record what numbers had been called, um, but it's no longer relevant. It's no longer the way that telephones work, and yet we have statutes on the books all over the world 
that refer to this specific piece of technology. So what I mean when I say that there is a fundamental problem related to the internet that involves technology in law and policy, I mean that there's often a debate about what these technological words mean. Either you can draft a statute very broadly so that it will not be subject to technological obsolescence, but then it's very difficult to interpret it. What is meant by any private communication, for example? On the other hand, in many countries have obsolete statutes that are drafted very specifically, and then the challenge is to argue that a term like a pen register should actually apply to something on a computerized telephone switch. Even though there's nothing that's now called a pen register anymore, you would have to argue, well, they meant something that would be used to record phone numbers, and we certainly have that capability now, although it's done with computers. In this presentation, what I hope to get across is that there are three basic problems that you'll find recur whenever you're dealing with technology, but particularly the technology of the Internet. The first problem is sovereignty and jurisdiction, which, which refers to the fact that Internet communications travel through many jurisdictions, and it may be advantageous to argue from one as opposed to another. The second is that the capabilities of technology are often in dispute. Is it possible to know who's accessed what communication? And the third is that it's difficult to know what statutes might refer to when dealing with technology because they often deal with very specific terms. On the contrary, sometimes they deal with very vague terms, leaving a lot open to interpretation. In this presentation, I used a trace route to show you that it is possible to follow packets on the internet and see where they go and that they are located at particular computers and that these computers uh, can be traced. Going back to the Traceroute software, you see here that with this Traceroute software, I can do things like look up who owns a particular computer. These records are not always accurate, but in this case, it appears that um, visitpalestine.ps is at least hosted at 2800 28th Street in Santa Monica. These, this kind of information is available, uh, although sometimes it can be unreliable. If you'd like to pursue this on your own, uh, there are a variety of free Traceroute software packages that you can use. Um, all you have to do is download them, uh, and at least it will give you some sense of how the internet works and why certain websites might be located one place or another, or certain mail servers might be located one place or another. This concludes my presentation, and I hope this is useful uh, to writing briefs related to the internet. Thank you very much.